This is the second lecture in our look at the digestive system in chapter 15. Um, we're going to be looking at sections 4, 5, and 6 in the chapter. So we're starting with how food moves um, once it's left the mouth, um, or once it's, it's entered the mouth and been chewed up at least, how the food um, then moves through the digestive system. So part of the process of chewing involves the production and use of saliva. There are many glands actually in the mouth that help to produce saliva, but we're just going to talk about the six major glands. Um, the first is called the parotid, and there are actually two parotids. They are the largest of the three gland types. The parotid glands lay just below and in front of um, each ear. They secrete the more watery component in saliva, and that watery component is high in a digestive enzyme called amylase that we'll talk more about in just a minute. The next largest glands are called the submandibular. So sub means below and mandibular means mandible or the lower jaw. So the submandibular glands are found at the very floor of the mouth, the very, very bottom, just inside the lower jawbone. And they secrete a much thicker fluid um, than the parotid glands. And that fluid is added to the fluid produced by the sublingual glands. So again, sub means below and lingual means the tongue. So these are the glands below the tongue. They're the smallest of the major salivary glands, and they are found um, also on the floor of the mouth. They produce the thickest of the components of saliva, and it is very, very heavy in mucus, so it gives kind of a stringy consistency to the saliva overall. Those three um, pairs of glands together, all of that fluid is kind of mixed in the mouth, and what happens is the amylase comes into contact with any large carbohydrates. So um, this would be things like starches, so bread, rice, pasta, um, any kind of candy, things like that that have carbohydrate sugars. And the amylase starts to break those large carbohydrates down into simpler sugars. Um, the thick mucousy component of the saliva that's coming from the bottom part of the mouth helps to kind of clump or bind the food together and make it a little bit more um, slippery or slimy to um, assist in the swallowing of the food itself. Um, so saliva can actually be produced by the presence of food. It, generally, if it's a food that you like or you think smells or tastes good, then more saliva will be produced, and unpleasant ones cause less saliva. That's why sometimes when you're eating something you really don't like and your mom's like, you have to finish it, you find it really difficult to swallow that less tasty food because your body's actually producing less saliva, and less saliva makes it harder for you to swallow. Um, the thing that's interesting, too, is even the thought of foods that you find appealing can cause more saliva to be produced. So once the um, salivary glands have done their job and the food is now kind of thickened up and ready to be swallowed, there are sort of a couple of parts that go into that process. Um, the first place that the food passes through is called the pharynx. We call it the throat in regular everyday language, um, but anatomically speaking, it's called the pharynx. And the pharynx it connects the um, oral cavity, the mouth, to the nose, and to the esophagus. So there are three parts, and we're going from the top of the pharynx, or the superior portion, to the bottom. The topmost portion is called the nasopharynx, and as you might guess, the nasopharynx connects to the nasal cavity. It allows space for breathing. The oropharynx is next, and it connects the um, mouth to the pharynx itself. So that's the oro part refers to oral. It's right behind the soft palate of the mouth. And it has two jobs. It allows for food, obviously, to get into the esophagus, and it also allows for air to pass from the nasal cavity all the way through the pharynx and down into the trachea and the lungs. The last part of the pharynx is called the laryngeal pharynx. This relates 
refers to the larynx, which is your voice box. That's why when you lose your voice, we call it laryngitis. That's an infection in the voice box. So the laryngopharynx is the um, most inferior or the bottom portion of the pharynx, and it connects directly to the esophagus. So let's say you've just had lunch. You've taken a big bite of food. You've chewed that food let's say maybe 20 times, um, lots of saliva has been added into the mix. The food is then formed into this kind of um, cylinder-shaped ball called a bolus. Um, the tongue helps to form that shape, and then it pushes, helps to push the food into the pharynx. As the food gets into the pharynx, a couple of different things happen. The soft palate raises up, so the roof of the mouth raises up to close off the nasal cavity. The hyoid bone, remember that's at the very back and bottom of the tongue, and the larynx, the voice box, raise up to prevent food either going up into your nose or down into your airway, the trachea. And then the tongue itself presses against the palate to close the oral cavity so that the food doesn't come back up into the mouth. So all of that's kind of happening at the same time, which is making there really only be one direction for the food to go. So if this is your mouth, the food is coming in and now it's being forced down into the esophagus because everything up here has been closed off by different structures, as well as closing off this second air, or not second airway, but the airway itself. So let's say the blue there will be our esophagus. And then the muscles at the top of the pharynx um, will start to push. They, they kind of contract and grab a hold on the food, whereas the muscles down here at the bottom go a little bit limp and a little bit more relaxed, and that allows for more space for the food itself to actually find a new location. And then peristalsis grabs on, and this keeps happening all the way down the esophagus to move the food toward the stomach. Um, so the esophagus itself is just under a foot long. It, there's not a whole lot happening in the esophagus. It's a pretty straightforward, <laughs> no pun intended, it's a pretty straightforward passageway. Um, it's hollow and it just connects the pharynx to the stomach. There's no absorption happening here and actually the food is in the esophagus for very little time. Um, what it does contain is a mucus layer just like the rest of the alimentary canal. And that mucus layer helps to keep the inside of the tube moist, which helps keep the food moving along. It's kind of a slippery surface. At the very base of the esophagus, you can see here, is the lower esophageal sphincter, or the LES, which is easier to remember, I think. And it is a, a band of muscle that kind of rotates open and closed to let food into the stomach and to keep food and chemicals from coming back up into the esophagus. So that leads us to the stomach. The stomach is basically a J-shaped pouch. It kind of looks like this. And um, it holds about a liter of fluid and food at any given time. It can be stretched to hold more, but the typical stomach is kind of designed to hold about a liter. Um, the two layers that are thickest here are the mucosa layer and the submucosa, so the two internal, the two innermost layers of the alimentary system. And they are thick and folded, so it looks kind of like this all throughout the stomach. As the stomach stretches out, the folds become smoother, um, but when the stomach is relaxed and not full, um, those folds are very pronounced. They're called ruga. Um, I don't know that that's a term we will use a whole lot, but um, you'll see it in some of the diagrams in your book, so I wanted to mention it to you. The stomach's biggest two jobs are to begin the digestion of protein, and then um, there's some absorption happening, not a lot, and we'll talk more about that um, at the end of the stomach section. So there are a couple different parts. The cardiac region is this part of the heart right here. It's right at the entrance. Um, the fundic region, it's a strange word, but that represents this um, kind of upper right portion of the stomach and it allows for some storage when the stomach is really full. The body region is this major portion of the stomach itself. 
Then we get into the pyloric region, which is down here right toward the end of the stomach. And then at the base of the stomach is another circular muscle, another sphincter muscle. This one is called the pyloric sphincter, and it leads into the small intestine. So we've got one at the top, the LES up here, and then the pyloric down at the bottom. So when food enters the stomach, um, a few different things sort of simultaneously begin to happen. We have, um, I mentioned these thick folds of mucosa and submucosa in the wall of the stomach, and there are little openings at the tip of each of these folds called gastric pits. These gastric pits are attached, or they are the end point of larger structures called gastric glands, which are inside the walls of the stomach. And the gastric glands produce um, all of the chemicals and liquids that help to break down your food. And then they release them through the gastric pits. So some of the fluids and things that are a part of the gastric juice, which is a delightful um, thought, gastric juice, includes mucus, which is very, very thick, just like any other mucus in the body. And its job is to coat the stomach wall for protection. Um, one of the other major substances released by the stomach wall is hydrochloric acid or HCL. And hydrochloric acid is an extremely powerful protein digester. So if we didn't have mucus protecting the, the wall of the stomach, then the hydrochloric acid would digest the stomach itself. And that would cause pretty significant problems for you. Um, then we have some digestive enzymes. Primarily, the enzymes that we're dealing with in the stomach are protein-based. Every single food type has digestive enzymes that are specific to that type. So proteins have their own enzymes that break them down. And in the stomach, there is a chemical called pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is stored in the cells of the stomach wall. As soon as the pepsinogen comes into contact with HCL, when it's released um, from the gastric glands, that creates a chemical reaction that changes pepsinogen into a protein called pepsin. The pepsin itself is what digests proteins. So the pepsin is released out into the stomach and anytime it comes into contact with a protein, it breaks that protein down into smaller parts. That's the job of the digestive enzymes. Um, a smaller component of the gastric juice is called intrinsic factor, which is a really bizarre name. But what it does is it allows your body to absorb vitamin B12. A lot of vitamins and nutrients are actually really difficult for the body to absorb all by themselves. And so they sort of hitch a ride with other chemicals or other foods that are easily absorbed, and then they can get into the body that way. So this is how B12 gets in. It gets, uh, it hitchhikes in with intrinsic factor. Um, some interesting facts for you. Your body makes up to about three liters of gastric juice every day, which is incredible. That's almost a full gallon of gastric juice. And very similar to saliva, just the thought of delicious food can cause the stomach to start releasing gastrin, which then kicks off the reaction of gastric juices being released. So just the thought of that pizza you might have at lunch can sometimes cause your stomach growling, right? You've got digestion starting to happen even though there's nothing in there. Um, and you'll hear that as a growling outside the body. So the final kind of wrap up things. Remember the stomach is not well designed for absorption. Those, that really, really thick layer of mucosa and submucosa, those are not, their job is not to absorb, their job is to protect. So the stomach does not do a good job of absorbing anything. What it does absorb tends to be liquid. So things like water, obviously. Alcohol, interestingly enough, is absorbed in the stomach quite easily. Um, some salt, um, different, not just table salt, but other kinds of organic salts. And then certain drugs, things like aspirin, for instance, that dissolve in fat and then the body takes them in through the stomach. Um, that's about it. When all of the food that's left, anything that hasn't been absorbed, gets thoroughly mixed with the gastric juice 
and thoroughly um, ground up in the stomach, it produces this very thick fluid called chyme. So it's pronounced as though it were spelled like that, chyme. Um, and then the chyme moves toward the pyloric sphincter, that muscle at the very bottom of the stomach. As the food gets close to that region, that muscle begins to relax, which makes it really easy for food to leave the stomach and enter the small intestine. And once the food has left the stomach, then the gastric secretions slow down. There's no need for gastric juices to be made at that point anymore. Um, we discussed this in class, but remember that it takes anywhere from three to six hours for food to um, enter and then leave the stomach as digested as it's going to be. Um, liquids obviously pass through really quickly. There's very little digestion happening there then carbohydrates, then proteins, and finally fats. Fats take a long time for the body to deal with. So please write a summary and bring in three clarifying or discussion questions, and I will see you in class. Thank you.